and just go over the question again. Okay, so um, just a brief history of the Tonner Doll Hospital. Um, the Doll Hospital, we started several years ago. I actually started working for the Tonner Doll Company, and we realized there was a big need. Everyone was calling and wanting us to fix their antique dolls or, you know, dolls that were passed down in the family. And so Robert and I sat down and we said, you know, there's a big need for a doll doctor. And I'm your girl. And he agreed, and we've been very successful ever since. Um, so this, this idea was born from a collaboration of uh, Yes, needs. yes. We realized the need rather quickly. Um, the phone calls started coming in. And um, once I told Robert, Robert, I did this for many, many years in my old DA hospital, so I was very confident that I could take on almost any, any one of these DA hospital patients. Um, how long uh, were you running the, the uh, previous DA hospital? The previous DA hospital I ran for about 10 years. I opened the first one up on Route 28 in Kingston, and then I moved about three or four years after that to a mall. Um, that probably was the downfall because the mall mentality was not the same as having a boutique type of shop where you had a DA hospital. So how do you think that now it, it's called actually like a DA hospital, how, how do you think that works out with the perception of people? That um, I think it works out good because the calls we're getting now is, oh my God, I've been looking for a DA hospital for years, I never knew there was one. Um, and uh, of course, there's some videos and things of me out there doing work that people saw, and they're very interested. Very, and people want to learn from me. They want to pick this up now when I'm done. I said, wait till I retire. <laughs> How? Um, from what locations? Like, is it uh, around the U.S.? Or the I've even g I get calls and patients from Canada, mm -hmm. um, every state in U.S. Most of the dolls that are in uh, this week are probably from California, Tennessee, New Jersey. They come from all over. Yeah, maybe now after this you'll get some from Asia. <laughs> <laughs> but I, let's hope so. I would not mind. I love to see dolls that I've never seen before. Right. Um, I think I know them all, but there's always one out there. What was the uh, oldest doll that you've worked on so far? Um, probably one of the oldest would be a cruder 1800s doll. Um, early on, a lot of dolls were almost handmade by cloth, and then they went into the china head dolls and um, and then of course the bisque head with composition body started around the turn of the century they're one of my favorites um, so uh, is there a limitation of the type of dolls that can be brought to the hospital um there's not so much a limitation but I don't work on Barbie <laughs> I do not work on Barbie Barbie is a field unto itself it's considered a newer doll and um, I'm, I just I've never really this sounds crazy never owned one and I'm not real comfortable with working on them. I really take in antique to vintage to modern dolls. Uh, is there a, a range for the hospital fee for the dolls? Um, it depends. Um, the average fee can run anywhere from $10 for just um, a little orthopedic arm surgery, just reattaching arms, and it can go up to $300 to $500 if it's extensive work. And uh, by that one, it's all cracked and broken, and, there, and I have a lot of re-sculpting. If it takes 15, 20 hours, it's going to cost. So what type of tools uh, do you use in, in, in the, for your operation? Your it's business? funny. In our OR, we use tools much like a regular operating room. Um, sometimes we have the rubber gloves and gowns. We use hemostats to clamp off the elastic rather than a blood vessel. Uh, we use syringes to put putty inside eye sockets and to get into tricky play. So a lot of times people will look at my tools and they'll see little scalpels and hemostats and they'll say, this is just weird. But we use a lot of things that an OR would use. The nice thing is no anesthesia. Have you, uh, the way you sound, you're, you're very well versed. Did you ever work in, in a regular hospital? Or? I was a science major. I've always been interested in science. So those are the courses, you know, biology, chemistry, that I always gravitated towards. And I have a history in fitness. Uh, I've got certified in nutrition and personal training, so I, I'm always kind of on the science side of things. Great. Um, how long uh, is there a normal time frame or average time frame in restoration of a doll? Um, if a doll comes in, I would like to finish it within two weeks. Uh, that's not always possible. I've had boxes here lined up for three weeks. 
Um, I try to get as many patients in and out in a day, but I give them all quality time. Um, so I feel I want them to get uh, their money's worth, and I want the doll to be totally healed before it leaves. Um, is there an average of number of dolls that you admit in a day? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it runs from, it would be easy if four patients came into the ER every day. Uh, usually it's about six to ten. And there is a waiting, to, not unlike a regular emergency room, some patients have to wait. But luckily they're not complaining, but they do have to wait. Um, so how do you feel like every time you're able to repair? That's why I do what I do. I will probably never be wealthy being a doll doctor, but the reward that I get is when someone comes in to pick up a doll and starts crying, and it's the emotion. People form attachments to dolls that you really can't explain. It brings back a time in their childhood when they felt safe or loved, or, um, and when you bring that back to somebody and you see how happy they are, that's why I do it. Uh, do you ever, did you ever have any experience that maybe when you were growing up, when you first was able to repair a doll yourself, like your own? Uh, yeah, well, what actually started, it's a funny story. Back in the day, we had what we called dumps. Local dumps where people would drop off their trash and their old toys. I used to beg my father every weekend to go to the dump so I could rescue a doll. I would bring home a, a stinky, smoky, smelly doll, and I would clean it up and fix it and dress it. So I started restoring dolls probably when I was five or six years old. That's great. Um, is there, are, in the type of damages when you receive these dolls, are there common damages that you find? Uh, the, probably the most common damages are orthopedic. A lot of dolls, their arms and legs are attached with elastic. And sadly, it doesn't last for much like our joints and cartilage. It's not going to last forever without some sort of preventative care. Storage, people will, will store them in the wrong place. Dampness, humidity will damage the elastic. Sometimes just age, not unlike us, will damage uh, their connection. So what I end up doing is attaching I would say restringing and attaching limbs is the most common um, emergency room visit we get. And then the second I want to say is cracks from either mishandling or again the age, not like the, the wrinkles we get. Some of the cracks are pretty intense and we have to use a lot of fillers. <laughs> uh, what is the most unique, uh, I guess, restoration job you have? The, the one that I will remember the most is a ventriloquist dummy that had a, a jaw and springs and strings and a stick and, a, and a, I never worked on one. And I wasn't 100% confident, but I ended up getting attached to this thing. I, I cried, it was so hard to fix. And when I finally got it fixed, I didn't want to give it up. I loved, I, I, I formed a bond with a ventriloquist dummy. I remember that one the most. Was that one an antique as well? It was old, yeah, it was vintage. It was an early um, kind of barrel chested ventriloquist dummy. Um, but it was pretty complicated. It took, it, it, it wasn't rocket science. That's where my problem, because I, I kept trying to make it more complicated than it was. But I could not get that jaw to stay in spring-loaded. And when I finally figured out, I was like, oh, my God, I should have thought of it as a child. I would have fixed it in 10 minutes. But How long did that actually take? Too you? long. <laughs> that was not a moneymaker. That probably took... Um, I want to say three or four days. One day I actually stayed here because that was the day I just threw my hands up in the air and I said, come on, I know I can do this. I asked our shipper, would you look at this thing and tell me how the heck it works? And he couldn't even figure it out. When everybody left and it was quiet, and I had a little cry. Then him and I, we kind of became friends, this dummy, and I finally fixed it. But it was amazing. Um, any other information that maybe we haven't that you find interesting or unique about um, I, You know what I think? I think it's a dying art. Da hospitals, um, like other restoration, we, we've c come to a disposable society for a while where people just felt it was easier to throw things away and buy new. Now they're looking at the doll as, as a, a vessel that holds something, whether it's a feeling or love or it's passed down as a family heirloom. Dolls are not disposable. I do not believe in throwing a doll away. Are there any um, type of material that's, that's more or less gives that feeling more than others? 
You know what it is? It's different for every person who owns the doll. I've had people come in that are in their 90s that come in clutching their doll and have a hard time even leaving it overnight for repairs. Um, but then also I have the child that comes in that is so attached. So the value of a doll is so directly related to the person who owns it. You can't even put a price on it. So what are the age ranges? Um, the youngest person that came in with the doll was about four years old. I, I like working for, for children because they're, they're, very, they're very appreciative and very smiley and very happy. And they, I get a lot of hugs. And the oldest person was probably about 92. So, and I've had men and women. It's not, it's not a women-dominated field. There are a lot of men who, who have, you know, something, even an action figure or something that Pinocchio. I've done wooden Pinocchios. So it's not just a woman thing. So, also, maybe we might have gone through it a little bit. Uh, uh, so you also collect, I mean, you started out, like, collecting dolls of it. Yes. So, I mean, would you be able to have, like, an actual, considered a collection? Or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any favorites? Like, what year? What does um, I started collecting the older dolls. Probably the turn of the century antique bisque heads. Some of them that were made for the French market at around 1900 are gorgeous. That's how I started. Then all of a sudden it became sort of like an, an addiction where I was always on the hunt. And the minute you got one, you couldn't wait for your next. And uh, I started then moving into the 50s dolls, hard plastics, then moved on to the artist dolls. Um, so, yeah, I've collected, I still have a lot of dolls, way more than I should. I don't want to seem like that crazy cat lady with 300 cats, but I probably have 300 dolls. I mean, where would you find, uh, where would you find these dolls like fancy cats? You know, it's funny, you can find them almost anywhere if you look. Flea markets, yard sales, um, uh, yes, I've been known to pick them out of a trash bin. I've, down, I've dumpster dived for dolls. Um, uh, almost anywhere, even, you know, doll shows are obvious, but um, yard sales are a good place to pick up some, some beautiful things. I mean, for some people that may not have access to that, um, I mean, is online also a good source? Online is great. Online is a little bit trickier because you have, you have to have an element of trust or intellect. You have to know what you're buying. You can't randomly look at a picture and say, oh my God, I love that. It looks like a rare French doll. I'm going to spend 5000 And then you find it's a reproduction worth 200 So you have to be very careful. But I've bought a lot of dolls online. I could tell you stories, but I won't. <laughs> but about the stories, how these people break their dolls and all the stuff they do, it's just like crazy. But um, they call me the doll whisperer. Uh, because li literally I listen to story after story about dolls and the, every doll that comes in usually someone will write a little handwritten note but this one says dear Dr. Noreen I have packed the doll parts in old clean socks and bubble wrap I've had this doll since 1945 I had a very bad case of double bulbar pneumonia and was near death and in an oxygen tent my father's co-worker sent me this doll. I enjoyed it so much. I made gowns for her, etc. But the years have taken their toll and she has gone to pieces literally. Please take good care of her. So you can see what a doll means to a person. You dice on that, really. But And there are always those dolls that come in that there's no hope for. Um, and we have a little morgue here where these dolls are organ donors. Yep, they've all signed their card. They're willing to give up parts to save other dolls. And as you can see, some dolls that are really too far gone, that wouldn't be worth fixing, a lot of people would love to see, you know, their arms and legs or ears or any other part used to save a life of another doll. Even an old doll head, these eyes can be taken out and she can donate her eyes or teeth. 
Um, and we do have our organ donors up here also, and these are where we've already gleaned the parts um, that we can that are going to be donated, and they just sit, and you can see why he died, but uh, they're up here just waiting to make another doll live again. About the orthopedic surgery, yes. reattach all the limbs and head. This one um, definitely needs a lot of fillers, the crackhead. Um, over here, this one, I am going to clean up all the compo first, and then I'm going to start filling in his head. Um, once we get this head filled in a little bit, this is a lot of damage, but sadly with this type of material, it does happen. I've already glued as much of it as I can, so when it gets to the point where I can't glue anymore, then we start with fillers. Um, and uh, I will just keep filling and sanding this one until the head is repaired. But again, cleaning the composition, and then I will repaint the lips. I only repaint just enough so that the doll looks um, the way it was intended. I will not repaint an entire doll. It just, it changes. It's like changing the patina of fine furniture. It's just something you don't want to do. But you probably see, we have, um, special waxes with pigments added and um, it's almost magical sometimes I'm just going to show you what this can do and you'll see a difference right away from one side to the other um, on what a difference now once the entire doll is done naturally the finish will be clean and fresh and you won't see the, the crazing and the cracking but that's just a small area I plan on cleaning this whole doll first then filling in the head and I have some very special fillers for this type of material also but but uh, the waxes and pigments do such a beautiful job on composition dolls and um, sometimes you get a little bit of a workout, you know. It's not, um, it's not work for the delicate, that's for sure. So based on this work, uh, would you say that um, it, it's part science, but it's also part art? Yes. Yes. This job is uh, probably 50% science, because you do have to use certain chemicals and certain things adhere to certain things and vinyls are treated different from composition which is treated different from bisque but also in order to recreate the look that a doll had in 1920 you have to either have a very good skill in copying which would be me or a certain amount of artistic talent I think the artistic talent comes in when you have to re-sculpt parts from scratch and I've, I've, had, I've made a lot of fingers in my time. It's amazing. Neutral wax, depending on what you're doing. And then you want to add the pigment that's going to have the same undertone as the original composition. Composition, and as you see, I have one, two, three composition dolls in front of me. And would you believe all three have completely different skin tones? If you look at this composition girl, she's got a very orangey, and that's her original skin tone. This one has a very creamy, tan kind of a lighter skin tone, not so ruddy and red. And then this big baby has almost got a porcelain, kind of luminescent sort of skin tone. So again, matching the paints, which is why I have little cups all over and, and all different shades of paint. Matching the paint can be very important when you're um, touching up a doll. The cleaner went right here, and then you kind of see next to the finish over here. It's a remarkable. I usually mix and make my own cleaners, because I've even had people say, give me the recipe. What exactly are you? I won't tell till I'm ready to retire. <laughs> so with these type of touch-ups, is there, um like a time when you'd have to get it redone again? Or? Um, with composition, see the problem with composition mm -hmm. dolls, one of the reasons I, I don't personally collect a lot of composition dolls, composition is wood pulp and glue. It's like 
sawdust. It's very much the way the cheaper particle board furniture is made. It responds to humidity the same way. It expands and contracts and expands. And then, of course, the paint is expanding and popping off or cracking. Um, so these dolls, I do not believe, will last forever. Um, you know, I think there's going to be a time when you don't see any more composition dolls. Now, luckily, what I use on them is sort of a preservative also because the wax will help the finish last longer. I doubt if it will last forever, though. And that's her right there. Okay, this is how that doll that you just saw came in. And sadly, let me tell you what they did to this poor baby. Um, here's her foot snapped right off. <clears throat> There's her hand snapped right off. I knew that this hand went here but needed a finger. Um, you can also see this foot goes to this leg. This leg belongs over here and somebody put a wooden peg in it. The saddest thing to me uh, that happened is all that black electrical tape that was so hard to get off. But if you take a very good look at her face, you'll see that somebody, if we can get here, somebody decided to repaint her face horribly. They took heavy black pencil and made eyebrows, which that doll should have never had. And also they put um, nail polish on her lips. Um, I'm happy to say that I've now got her back exactly the way she once looked. But isn't that amazing? <laughs> okay, then I removed the nail polish, that red-purple nail polish, off of her lips and put the proper color. This doll is, you know, 30s, 40s. They had an orangey tint lip color. So I went back to the original lip color on her. And if you look at her legs, everything here is original. There's no replaced parts. What you will see is a slight mark here. That's where all that electrical tape was. But these are the original legs and feet. They all came out perfect, no major issues. And this was the hand that was broken off and the finger. This is a re-sculpted finger. That is not the original finger. And again, you'll see a small line of demarcation where the sculpted finger is attached. But other than that, she has no trouble with the use of her hands whatsoever. And this is that doll. Um, what about the uh, clothing, that, I guess the, uh, the piece here? She's doing? just going home in a nightgown. Uh -huh. Some people want their dolls and they will pay for me to look online and purchase clothing. I am not a seamstress. The one thing I don't do is sew. So if you want me to dress your doll, mm -hmm. let's get online and look for an outfit. <laughs> so, but when you received it in pieces, it did not come with an outfit. No. So you're... No. Yeah. Had yeah. nothing on. Now, a lot of times we will put a hospital gown. We have literal hospital gowns made for smaller dolls. So they don't go home naked. Okay. For $20,000. I was so scared to touch it. I'm like, oh my God. I don't want to drop it. I don't want anything to happen to it. When a doll comes in that's worth six to twenty thousand dollars, I will get rid of everything else on the table and I will do that doll right away. I just don't want it around that long. God forbid, you know, anything can happen. And um, it's a little scary. I don't want to be responsible. <laughs> but um, again, the sentimental value for most dolls can even be more to some people. So, you know, hard to say, but. Um, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting job. It might be a rare job, but it's, um, it's a great job. Um, are you aware or is there some kind of history for doll hospitals in, in the U.S.? Um, I haven't heard of a history. You know, years ago, mommies used to patch, repair. <laughs> um, children only had one doll. Um, in years gone by, you were lucky to have that, and then maybe every year your mom or aunt or somebody would make an outfit for it. Um, in those days, uh, the moms became the doll doctors. And that, as I said, times change, you know, we had the Industrial Revolution, times got good. People said, oh, your doll's broke, throw it away, we'll take you out to the five and dime and get you a new one. Um, I think people are going back to, to being a little bit more frugal again also. 
memories. You know, the baby boomers are now older and the baby boomers are now losing their parents left and right, as sad as it is, and they want to hang on to that one last memory. And I think that's why I'm seeing an influx of old and antique dolls, because I'm getting the story, my mom passed away and this was her doll. So yeah, it means a lot. I do more uh, things like this than anything. Reattaching limbs. And uh, again, this is where we use a lot of hemostats and hooks and uh, needle nose pliers. And uh, there's always a bar somewhere inside these heads. If not, you can always adapt and make something. What I do is try to hold everything together till I get a little tension on the elastic. And this way, I won't have to constantly be uh, putting that hook back in. Once we get the elastic in, and we don't need nearly this much, but it comes through the body. And again, these aren't clamping blood vessels, so not to worry. <laughs> They're only clamping elastic. But it's funny how a lot of the same tools are, are used. This one on. You always have to be careful too, you get the right leg on. <laughs> yeah, I have literally strung dolls and then look down. I say, oh, that doesn't look right, and have the left leg where the right one should be, and the right one where the left one should be. So you might want to take a quick look and say, yep, that looks right. And then we will. And the muscle part is going to come in at the end when I actually have to tie a very tight knot. And you need the knots tight enough so that this doll can actually hold a pose, but not so tight that you um, split the neck anywhere because it is an awful lot of tension. But just keep your arms nice and strong, that's for sure. This is the way most dolls that are this age are strung today. We use a cloth coated stringing elastic, which is a lot like a bungee cord. Years ago, they used, you know, rubber bands. They used all kinds of stuff, rubber bands. I think pretty much whatever they, they had, they used. And uh, this stuff is pretty sturdy and seems to last a long time. This doll still needs to be cleaned and a few other, obviously a little hair would help. Um, but once we get the arms on, and you will see that she will hopefully be able to stand, or at least in a stand she'll be able to stand. The arms go the same way. Uh, there's usually little metal hooks inserted inside these composition dolls. And if they're not there, they can actually be purchased. There are doll supply stores now that sell almost anything you would need to repair a doll. Um, again, there's not enough doll hospitals, I don't think, in the world. It's kind of a craft that you have to do for many, many years before you get it right. Uh, trial and error. And as I said, if you want to go back to the days where you go to the dump and pick up a messed up doll, that might be a good way to start. <laughs> but if not, uh, there are tutorials online that literally will teach people how to string a doll, how to root a head, how to set eyes, you know, things like that. Just want to make sure that this is tight enough so it doesn't pop off. Yeah, this is where the strength is going to definitely come in. Good thing you have the background. <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> Sometimes I even I have people hold a doll while I restring it so I can actually get them tight enough. Now again, this doll is going to need some major cleaning before and hair. We've already picked out a lovely do, so I will glue this on after the doll is completely clean. But you can see orthopedic surgery is a big thing around here. 
um, limbs are nearly always off. And I'm going to use the same type of cleaner for this doll as we did for this one, but probably with a little less pink in the mixture because this almost has a yellowish, slightly different skin tone than the original. So I will take the same type of wax, but change the pigment just enough. Sometimes this will actually work, but if there's a lot of crazing, I'll just do a little spot on the knee. And then if you look at the one knee compared to the other, you should see a little bit of a, a difference. And you can you can see this wax will actually work, so that will save me some time today, and we might get four or five patients done versus the usual, you know, some jobs I can get done in 20 minutes, some take me three weeks. On here, and this was plastered in the head. Mm -hmm. When the doll was upright, it would hold the eyes up. When you laid them down, it would rotate in the plaster and you would see the lid. So the eyes, this is the earliest sleep eye mechanism where, you know, when the eyes are on, and as I said, this is probably an example to show you, the head's too big, but when the doll is upright, the eyes are looking straight out. When you lay the doll back, this lead weight will drop and the eyes close. Very crude, but it works so well. All you had to do is plaster this on each side of the temple inside the head. And as the plaster is drying, just gently move them open and close via the lead weight, just so it created a little groove. Mm -hmm. And once the plaster dried, which is usually pretty quick, 10, 15 minutes, um, then you had perfect sleep eyes. So we do that here too. Again, this is a turn of the century, about a 19, maybe a 1915 to 1920 Simon and how big bisque doll head. She needs a lot of work. <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> Definitely needs a lot of work. <laughs> 1940 and it had rubber applied ears in a hard plastic head and the ears actually over time um, because they were rubber got very brittle and they crumpled up and disintegrated. If you can get a matching vinyl ear and cut it, as I said, you need organ donors here. Um, you can literally replace the applied ear on a hard plastic dighty head with vinyl ears and it works out perfect. descriptive. She literally describes a doll doctor as somebody that's, you know, very, very old and crumpled up in the compo dust in her gray hair up in a bun. And I'm thinking that's exactly what everybody thinks, that to be a doll doctor, you have to be this old wizened crone. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I don't really want to be labeled that yet. You know, 30 years from now, whatever, but really not yet. But it was such a pleasant <laughs> surprise for her to write that. I was like, oh God, that is really amazing.